It's top 100 list season around the basketball internet. And on almost everybody's lists, Mikhail Bridges is ahead of DeAndre Ayton. Is that real? Is that legit? We'll break it down on today's episode of Locked on Suns. You are Locked on Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past five seasons and a writer at Suns.com and Dime Magazine. Big, big thanks for making Locked on Suns your first listen here on this Wednesday morning. We are back to five days a week. If if it's your first time finding the show, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. If it's not your first time and you haven't subscribed, join the newbies. Hit subscribe. Hit follow on whatever podcast platform you're finding us on, as well as YouTube. We are everywhere. We are free everywhere. And the best way to keep us that way is to hit subscribe subscribe, and just tune in. That's all you got to do. You can also follow along on Twitter at LockedOnPHXSuns if that is your jam. Mikhail Bridges and DeAndre Ayton, I mean, they're two players, I think, obviously, who've been compared for the entirety of their careers, right? They were both uh, draft day picks, uh, 2018 draft picks by the Phoenix Suns, both top 10 picks. And players who are both pretty polarizing. I don't think we talk about Mikhail Bridges as a polarizing player, but he, I mean, he really is, right? He's such a unique type of talent. He does so many things really well. And then he does a lot of things that are obviously weaknesses. And and Aiton, I think, is the same thing. That was really the thing that I realized putting some notes together for this. But I want to I want to list out the rankings because CBS and ESPN both places that have a big NBA full-time staff, people who put a lot of time into these lists, they both put Bridges above Aiton. So on CBS's list, Bridges was at 51. DeAndre Aiton was at 58, all right? And then on ESPN's list, which is obviously much more uh, talked about because it's ESPN, 49 for Bridges, 51 for DeAndre Ayton. So that's a choice, right? Because... You could do the cheat thing where you put them back to back and then you say, well, they're basically tied. They didn't do that, right? Even ESPN has one player between the two of them. And I think the extra thing, the extra layer of spiciness about this whole thing is it would have been easier probably if you are, and this has been the case every year up to this point, right? Where like Suns fans might have been debating Bridges and Aiton a little bit. Most national people, it's so easy to just say Aiton was the number one overall pick, right? Bridges was number 10. Uh, Bridges, even now we have their second contracts to compare. Bridges is is making like 20-something million a year, whereas Aiton is making uh, a max, right? So this is, this, this is pretty, uh, it's spicy. I don't know another way to put it. Um, to, di- to go out of your way to put Bridges over Aiton when the contract, the draft slot, the public perception, all of it would tell you Aiton's a better player, right? So let's dive into it. So I put together, I compiled the advanced metrics for both guys at four different um, all-in-one stat sites, okay? So dunksin3s.com puts out effective plus minus. On that stat, Bridges was plus 1.5, Aiton was plus 3.2. Real plus minus, Bridges was three plus 3.7, Aiton plus 2.9. So Bridges won in that one. And Bridges won in the other, other three. Effective plus minus was the only metric where Aiton won, so to speak, okay? So Raptor is from 538. Bridges won in a landslide there, plus 2.7, whereas Aiton is just plus 0.9. And then LeBron, which is from Basketball Index, they're basically tied at around 1.3 to 1.1, okay? So Bridges is the leader in three of those. Aiton is a leader in one, uh, but the one that Aiton is the leader in seems to be the most trusted stat out there right now. If you read these stats type of people, they all are deferring to effective plus minus. That's kind of the latest sexy one. And Aiton's 
rating there is double bridges. Okay, so I think to me that's pretty inconclusive. It, it maps out as maybe bridges has a slight edge, but overall, I think you would probably look at that and say they're fairly equal, right? There's not a lot of wiggle room between them on any of them except for the one that Aiton is leading on, and then he's double on that one. So. Let's go through the pros and cons for both players. And I know you guys all have your opinions on this already. Trust me, I do too. Like, I, I'm not, uh, I didn't like reevaluate my entire vibe on them as players just for a random episode on a Wednesday, okay? I will get to what I think, but it's worth the thought experiment, especially because um, we're going into a season where I think both of these guys are going to have to do more. So, on the positives in Aiton's column, I think there's three things. He plays the most important defensive positions and he executes that at a really high level, right? He's a big man. He's the defensive anchor. That's one of the most irreplaceable things in the league. If you can have a great defensive anchor center in the modern NBA, that is still really, really important. Number two, he's a very, very efficient play finisher, both at the rim and from mid-range. Um, efficiency is never going to be an ugly thing to be able to do in the NBA, right? It's always going to have value. And he does it really, really well. He's one of the most efficient finishers in the entire league. And he has that mid-range shot now as well. Third, I just think you can't deny the fact that what people have been saying about him since he was a freshman at U of A is undeniable. His size and athleticism and the combination of both of those things together in one body is rare in the NBA. Like, again, no matter how long into the future the NBA continues to evolve, DeAndre Ayton and what he is physically will still be valuable, especially when you pair it with a good degree of skill. All right, so negatives on Ayton. And we'll rifle through these pretty quickly. Lack of aggressiveness, so he doesn't get a lot of easy shots and free throws, not much of a shot creator overall for himself or for his teammates. Lack of a three-point shot, not just the fact that he doesn't have one. I don't think you should knock players for things they don't do unless there's some sort of reason why he would be able to do it, but it's always been there as a tantalizing possibility, right? And so, okay, if he doesn't do that, um, maybe you don't knock him too much, but it does limit his the lineup construction you can put around him, the spacing that you're going to have offensively. They've been able to work around it, but that does naturally pose challenges to how you're building an offense. He alt on defense alters, but doesn't always block shots. And then he's pretty darn versatile, but he's not at that top tier of versatility the way that a Bam Adebayo, Draymond Green, Jaron Jackson, those guys have proven themselves to be. Okay. So pros and cons for him, right? Okay. Pros, positives for Mikhail. Elite point of attack defender, elite team defender, elite turnover creator, and elite transition finisher. So if you have him on your team defensively, you're going to suck up the air in the room for opposing ball handlers and creators, and you're going to turn that into transition points pretty nicely for yourself, all right? The last point defensively is he can defend a variety of positions. Most of the time, he's going to be able to defend one through four. I would say in best case scenarios, you only ask him to defend one through three, but either way, he's going to do a darn good job at all of those, and that's highly valuable in the NBA. Uh, offensively, solid three-point accuracy. He can play in any lineup because he does all the little things on offense, ball movement, cutting, shooting. And then I think to sum it all up, like he's just one of the best of the most valuable type of role player in the entire NBA, right? He gives the Suns an answer to opposing offensive engine superstar level players. And then offensively, he's going to fit next to whoever you put him in with and he's going to do his job at a really high level. Negatives for Mikhail Bridges. And yes, there are some. This is crazy, right? We don't talk about Mikhail like there are negatives very often. And I get that. He's a very much a fan favorite. Obviously, if you're nitpicking or you're really breaking down his game, we all know what these limitations are. But I think the perception thing is important here. Like, I'm obviously no uh, exception. I'm, a, I'm really hard on Aiton. And I think I give Bridges a little bit of, a little bit of slack for these negatives. So let's, let's just hit them really quickly. Uh, one that I actually think is another thing, uh, specific thing that goes under the radar that that's an example of this is his three point volume, right? So he's a good shooter, but he doesn't take a lot of threes. Like, you know, you look at the end of the finals last year, you look at the Mav series. He is not somebody who is going to find ways to continue to take and make threes 
if they're not there for him, if the game rhythm is not benefiting him. And that matters, right? Like the best, the very, very best shooters in the NBA, they're never going to have games where their shooting is not a factor. Yeah, they might go cold, but Klay Thompson is not in a big game where, you know, where his offense is necessary to win. He's not going to have a game where he only takes two or three triples, right? He's going to take them. So that matters. Uh, I think McHale also struggles to defend bigger, stronger scorers, whether that's Chris Middleton, Anthony Davis, some of the more physical big guys, not just big men, but even guys like Middleton who use their bodies and their strength. I think you might put Luke on that list now too. Uh, and then McHale's also not much of a shot creator, just like I said about Aiton. And also, like I said about Aiton, his lack of aggressiveness results in not a lot of free throws or other easy shots. That includes layups and dunks, right? McHale doesn't get to the basket. He doesn't draw fouls. So, my takeaway going through that exercise is they're very similar players. It's kind of crazy to think about that, but they are very much role players. They have both, um, you know, maybe lost some developmental opportunities on both ends, I think, because of the championship chasing that the Suns have been doing, the fact that Chris Paul came in, uh, all of it. And so they're both like high level two way role players, but within their roles on both ends of the floor, they're not asked to do a whole ton of different things, right? Aiton defensively, it's a lot of drop into the paint, protect the rim, uh, and, and don't make mistakes. Bridges, it's, you know, chase ball handlers, rotate the right way, be there as a help guy for your teammates. Offensively, they both are just play finishers, right? They don't get a lot of opportunities to create. They both aren't very good at it yet. And so it's kind of funny, right? Uh, but I think the other thing here is from this this ranking standpoint from ESPN and CBS. And I think we'll see it borne out. Sports Illustrated will have their list. I wouldn't be surprised if it was the same narrative drives this stuff, whether we want to believe that or not. Right. So bridges and Aiton are basically equal. I just discussed that value role, all of it. They're pretty equal. And I think the other part is too defensively. It's hard to evaluate them separately. You know, they guard, they are the duo that squelches out pick and rolls for the Suns defense, right? Without either one of them, the defense gets leakier. They don't have quite, they don't have another ball handler or like a point of attack defender like, like Bridges. They don't have another rim protector like eight. And so if you lose either one, the other one's going to suffer. That's important here too. How do you say one's better than the other if they're so coupled together so much? But we all know Mikhail Bridges finished second in defensive player of the year, right? Whereas Aiton, I mean, he was cast aside by his own team, right? He's getting into it with the coach. The team doesn't bring him back. He has to go get an offer sheet. The narrative drives this stuff at the end of the day. I think going through that exercise, being honest with myself, the degree of difficulty of what DeAndre Ayton has to do, the potential that's still there, the thing, the highest highs that he's reached, those moments are, are more special, more valuable, better, more important, whatever word you want to use, than the highest highs that Mikhail Bridges has reached and the level of value of, or I'm sorry, the level of difficulty of what Bridges is asked to do. All right. So I think Aiton should be ranked higher. I get why he's ranked lower. And I wouldn't be surprised if next summer, I do think Aiton will get more opportunities this year. If next summer, uh, this is flipped again, because I don't think Bridges is getting second in DPOY again. And Aiton's contract stuff won't loom quite as large unless he gets traded. The Suns made a signing today. Frank Jackson here on Tuesday afternoon reportedly headed to the Suns on a non-guaranteed deal. Talk about what that signing means and why the biggest takeaway from it might have way more to do with Chris Paul than anybody else. First, though, guys, today's show brought to you by Bet Online, your number one source for all pro and college football betting needs all season long. The latest developments, game matchups, news and analysis to inform your betting, access the best information, all of it at Bet Online, of course, making bets being the most important part as well. I was going to talk about the ASU odds for all of you. Uh, I'm not sure personally that I can stomach that. Uh, they were, of course, everybody knows this. I'm not breaking any news. They were 20 point favorites and somehow lost the game. So I would not be betting on them if I were you. But the Arizona Cardinals, our Arizona Cardinals, are three and a half point underdogs at home. I don't know. That kind of feels good. Home underdogs have performed well. At least they did in week one. I'm not sure about week two in the NFL. But that's the kind of thing you can find at Bet Online. Every single week, they're going to have odds for all the biggest games across both football leagues 
and more. So head to the website today. Use the mobile app to learn more about the latest trends and action. Bet online where the game starts. Okay, so Frank Jackson, who is he? What is it? What is he going to do on this Suns team? Okay, so he is most recently of the Pistons. He was drafted originally by the Pelicans. So this is going to be his fifth season in the NBA. Uh, sorry, this will be his sixth season in the NBA because he missed his first year with a foot injury. He got injured, yes, I'm remembering now. He was the 31st overall pick in his draft because he fell a little bit as a result of that injury. But statistically, the type of guy that he is, um, I mean, he's only 6'3". He does have a 6'8 wingspan, but rarely has he graded out as a very impactful defender. He doesn't really use that wingspan and, and size to get to the basket and finish layups and dunks. Um, so somewhat similar to campaign in that way, right? Like just more of a shooting type of guard. Um, Frank has been one of the worst assisters in the NBA among guards since he entered the league. Like talking about less than 100 assists sometimes as few as like in the sixties, despite getting pretty consistent minutes. And then he's up there in the forties or fifties on, on turnovers, like just a player who does not create for his teammates in an efficient way. And then last but not least, like I think most of his shots come from three, which you could say, okay, on this Suns team, that's pretty good, but he's only a career 33% deep shooter. His uh, COVID season 2021 was a really great shooting season, but that's been an outlier in his career. So he's basically somebody who wants to take threes, but isn't going to make a ton of them, isn't going to create for his teammates. And while you might say, okay, there's some potential with his size and, and whatnot, uh, he doesn't really use those tools to, to get to the basket or to you know make an impact as a defender. <laughs> okay. So that's pretty pessimistic, but it's a non-guaranteed deal. This is not somebody who's supposed to be playing a huge role. So what does it mean? What does the signing mean then if he's not somebody who is figuring to make a huge impact? Um, one, I think it can push campaign a little bit, right? Like it's it's not just gifting campaign the backup guard duties. I think that's maybe what they wanted with the Aaron Holiday thing was an idea of like, we'll have another option. If Payne doesn't have it, we can go to somebody else. I don't know if it's like a mental challenge as so much as it just says you can't roll into another season and have nothing. I don't think Jackson's an upgrade, but you know, whatever. And then the other thing is too, like you're making a bet he'll look better on a good team, right? Like I do think there's some aspect of that here where it's like, yeah, we can grade him on all these things he hasn't been able to do yet, but he was on the Pelicans and then he was on uh, the Pistons. He's never been on a good team. He's never played next to a guy like Devin Booker, never played next to a guy like Chris Paul, though he did play with Cade last year and that should, that should help, right? Who knows? But a good team, a great team, that we've seen it it work wonders for, you know, underachieving players in the past. Maybe this could be the case. So pros and cons. But again, as I said in the last segment, the most important thing about this pretty minor signing to me is that it signals that even in training camp, even in September of this season, the Suns will be placing an emphasis on getting more ball handlers in the building and limiting what Chris Paul has to do, okay? So whether Frank Jackson gets cut before opening night, which is surely a possibility, I don't, you know, the, the guarantee date on the deal hasn't been reported yet. It's not official yet. We don't know any of that. Could just be a camp deal. It could be something that's guaranteed, that guarantees, you know, early in the season. We don't know. This It's what Damian Jones got from the Suns the year that they traded for Chris Paul. Okay. And they ended up cutting him, but Jackson's perfectly capable as like a training camp preseason body, right? He's somebody who can easily be a fourth point guard behind Chris and Payne and book. If he does make the regular season roster, like he's better than each one more, right? I think like at least has a little more juice and upside to him than, you know, a veteran each one more did in that COVID season. So that can be really helpful during the next month or so while they're getting ready for the season. You don't have to have Chris out there in preseason and in these meaningless training camp moments. He has chemistry with this team. He doesn't need to be out there. Um, and then in the regular season, like there's worse options as like a fourth, fifth guard, right? We, all, we also remember Landry Shamit is there too. So, and then, you know, 
if forecasting if he were to make the regular season roster, like I guess the way I would put it is if you put Jackson on the floor with all of the rest of the sun starters, like let's say Cameron Payne starts the game uh, and Chris Paul's resting or Chris Paul's gets hurt. Right. Uh, and campaign starts. Like if you put Frank Jackson out there with like Booker bridges, Johnson and Dario charge, whatever, like they're really other uh, good lineups with other really good players. They can probably still survive those minutes. Like th- this is the luxury of being a really good team, right? Is you can bring on some of these warm bodies, and I it's disrespectful. And maybe he he flashes, but like to this point in his NBA career, he has not proven to be a difference maker. If you bring a guy like that on the floor, you can still be okay. You can maybe even win those minutes, win those games because of the other talent on the floor. So if he makes a regular season roster, I could see him providing value in that way, and all of it comes back to whether it's camp or potentially in the regular season, this is bringing another capable guard into the building to limit what Chris Paul has to do. That is very smart. I think it can really pay off if you want Paul to be as sharp as possible, as fresh as possible come April, May, and potentially June. There's been a lot of Robert Sarver news since I last talked about him last week. I know it is a tiring story, an exhausting story, a depressing story, so I don't want to beat it into the ground, but I do want to give updates. So we'll do that next, and I'll tell you why <laughs> the business is always going to drive change here as, uh, as much as that might not surprise anybody. We'll do that next. One more quick break first. Since we last talked about Robert Sarver here on Locked On Suns, four things have happened. Number one, PayPal says it will not renew its jersey patch deal after this season, which is when the deal expires, if Robert Sarver is still the owner of the team. Vice Chair John Najafi, a name we've talked about a lot here, uh, this, the number two shareholder for this Suns team, uh, demanded Sarver's resignation in a letter that he sent to Suns staff members that leaked to the media. Number three, the National Basketball Players Association, the union executive director, Tamika Tramalio, demanded Sarver's ban or the force, uh, a forced sale by him in an interview on ESPN. And then fourth, Draymond Green today on his podcast demanded that owners vote to oust Robert Sarver. He talked about how gross it will feel to go back into that stadium, whether you're a Suns player or a competitor. And basically have to see him be a, a shepherd and a figurehead of the league. You know, um, that was the way that, that Draymond kind of put it. So those are four big things. I mean, Draymond is one of the biggest off-court personalities of any player in the league. PayPal is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, sponsor of the team. Uh, Vice Chair John Najafi is one of the biggest shareholders of the team. He's the number two behind Sarver. Obviously didn't get appointed interim governor, but he is still technically the second biggest shareholder and then the leader of the union. I mean, the the lawyer leader, right? Not the not CJ McCollum, but the executive director. That's a big voice in the league. That's one of the maybe 10 biggest, most important people um, in terms of day-to-day decision-making in the NBA. Okay, so what really matters here? Uh, as much as I think all of those things are worth discussing are our, our, our checkpoints in this process that factor into what might ultimately happen. I think only PayPal, my, PayPal might be the only one of those that matters. Um, and I, 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 I'm not just saying that to be cynical or, you know, money's the only thing that matters. I don't really feel that way truly at the bottom of my heart, but uh, I do think there's some, some problems with some of the other things that may not help them uh, create actual change. So one is Tramalio claiming to speak for all the players, which is uh, the line that stuck out to me in her interview with Malika Andrews on ESPN. It feels like an exaggeration. I mean, it might not go over very well, right? Like, do you think every NBA player in the whole league believes the right thing is for Sarver to be forced out? I don't know. Um, We've seen some NBA players who think some pretty crazy things, right? I'm not crazy, but there is much more of a diversity of thought in the league than we like to think because of the way that it's framed as such a progressive league and the uh, racial justice stuff they did in 2020. But we saw players not kneeling, right? We saw players who didn't put things on the back of their jerseys, right? Like we saw 
a lack of cohesion in that. And so the idea that there's just this 100% approval of Tremolio, <clears throat> Tremolio's comments that Sarver should be removed from the league, it doesn't hold weight if it's not fully accurate, right? And like, if it's not fully accurate that it is every single player, then it's kind of like, well, then what are you really saying? Are you saying you as Tamika Tremolio or maybe Tremolio and the like leadership group within the union, like CJ McCollum and Jalen Brown and others? believe that okay that's pretty sizable but that doesn't it, it probably would actually hold more weight if the players themselves said it right than than just Tramalio. so that one didn't feel as weighty as it as it maybe could have um and then john the Jaffe, according to john gambadoro of arizona sports who's been really you know plugged into this ownership group for a long time it's no secret that he has interviewed robert sarver a lot over the years they are very uh, connected that show and Sarver it's Gambo has been here longer than most media members have like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but Njafi, according to Gambo has been an outsider in that ownership group kind of all along. And the other owners have been trying to buy him out for a while, according to Gambo. And so what he does, even if it is like, it was a pretty demonstrative thing to send a letter to the staff. That's, you know, that's going around the traditional sort of I have released a statement via my PR reps, like sending it directly to the staff. That's, that's pretty big. But if he's not somebody whose voice carried a lot of impact prior to now, um, I don't know why it would now, you know? So if Sarver didn't like him, if the other owners didn't like him, maybe if some of the high ranking leadership in the business of the Suns didn't like him, then kind of insignificant what he says right and we already knew how he felt because he he released a statement at the time of Baxter Holmes original article saying that he didn't you know had there's no place in the suns for this kind of behavior etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's not like it was a surprise that he came out against Sarver in this moment as well that leaves us to Draymond Green right like I think his comments might actually end up mattering second most not that it needs to be a ranking but you know, if you're following me, those four things I listed, I think green stuff might be second most impactful. Um, and I don't even think it's because of Draymond, right? He's not a Suns player. Uh, he's not like the superstar cream of the crop guys, but he was very direct. We talked about that last week when Ben Golliver came on the show about LeBron and CP's comments while they were pretty potent in terms of like, you know, going after the league a little bit and criticizing the, the, the punishment on Sarver they didn't list out what they wanted to see happen, right? They didn't say, you know, the league's punishment didn't go far enough. Sarver should be um, banned or the suspension should be longer or I'm not playing in the building that he runs if he's still the honest, things like that, right? Whereas Draymond was very specific. Like he should be, he went so far as to say like the odor, owners should hold a vote to remove him from the league, right? To force the sale of the team, which is a three quarters vote. That's pretty specific. And so I wouldn't be surprised if other people followed suit, whether it is Chris and LeBron getting another chance at media day to uh, be more specific. Steph, uh, you know, these other guys who have been very vocal about issues like this, who are the superstar cream of the crop players. And then maybe people like JJ Redick, who is, I believe he'll have his return uh, from summer break podcast out on Wednesday when most of you hear this, I wouldn't be surprised if he said something on his show um, or some of these other voices around the league. You've already heard Matt Barnes and, and Richard Jefferson and other media types, Kendrick Perkins, I believe, have come down pretty hard. But it's a different thing when it's somebody who has an even bigger platform like Reddick or Draymond uh, specifically. So that comment from Draymond now opens the floodgates a little bit and people can say, you know, oh, I thought Draymond spoke really eloquently and I, I back up what he said, right? It gives you, it gives other players and other voices around the NBA a little bit of a fallback if they don't feel super comfortable being direct themselves, okay? So I don't know where this goes. It doesn't feel like uh, there's not any momentum until all of a sudden there is, right? Like that's how these things work. Nobody's going to telegraph. Robert Sarver's not going to release a statement saying, okay, I actually have reconsidered. I, I may sell the team. You know, we won't know it until it happens, but these things do matter. I think, especially when they're business or, um, you know, famous people <laughs> speaking out. And in the case of Draymond and PayPal, that's what happened. 
All right, that'll do it for today's show, guys. A big thanks for making Locked On Suns your first listen here on this Wednesday morning. If you have not already hit follow or subscribe, make sure you do not miss a show in your feed. We are back to five days a week, so that means every day there will be a show in your feed, which means you got to stay vigilant and you definitely have to hit that follow button. All right. In the meantime, before we come back tomorrow, make sure you make Locked On NBA your second listen to catch up on the top 50 rankings courtesy of Bet Online. You'll hear my voice, you'll hear all the other local hosts breaking down one through 50 their rankings in the NBA. Talk to you guys tomorrow.